Welcome to tonight's forum, From Waste to Wonder, uh, where we're getting, gonna have a chance to explore together Chicago's next frontier, our river fronts. My name is Mary Sue Barrett, and I'm president of the Metropolitan Planning Council, and we're delighted to be a co-host, along with the city's Department of Planning and Development of tonight's forum. What we are here for is because uh, not only are we a co-host, but we are a a uh, very proud partner with the City of Chicago on Great River Chicago, which I'll tell you about in a moment, as well as the Chicago River Edge Ideas Lab. I'd like to give you a little bit of background about Great River Chicago to set the stage for our conversation with the panel. So back in 2015, Mayor Emanuel approached the Metropolitan Planning Council with the initial idea along with a group of funders. It was initially the Joyce Foundation, Chicago Community Trust, and ArcelorMittal who came together. Um, and we were quick, quickly joined um, by groups like the Friends of Chicago River and other funders, uh, Gaylord and Dorothy Donnelly Foundation, the Driehaus Foundation, Boeing, and together this powerful team of civic and governmental and investors um, had a vision about an inclusive process of listening to Chicagoans about what their visions were for our riverfronts. And the timing was right. Uh, this vision really could not have been possible just a few years ago because really a few years ago, none of us could imagine sipping a glass of rosé next to Lower Wacker Drive. <laughs> but that's what we are doing today. And the city winery has become a, a, a visiting point, um, along with many others, of our award-winning Chicago River Walk, which is really a three-season destination. Um, it's very exciting. The same is true of boathouses up and down the river. And there's been a sharp uptick in people's use of the river, as we can all see from those paddlers um, on our riverfronts. Since much of the activity is downtown, our charge was very clear from Mayor Emanuel. How do we connect all of Chicagoans and all of Chicago neighborhoods to the river? And when you visit the new Chicago River Edge Ideas Lab, which is just across the street, it's at 72 East Randolph. Um, this is part of the Architecture Biennial, and we hope that you come visit often between now and early January. Um, that you will also share our excitement um, for this next segment. This particular lab focuses on the segment from where the Riverwalk concludes today at Lake Street down to Chinatown and the Pingtown Park. So back in August of 2016, just a short, a little over a year ago, Mayor Emanuel uh, released the results of this listening process, uh, which is a vision called Our Great Rivers. And it's a vision for what is a number that continually uh, astounds me, our 150 plus miles of riverfront in Chicago. That's North Branch and South Branch. It's the Des Plaines River and the Calumet River. So we are proud that all of us coming together have been making progress, and that's not just recently, it's over decades. Uh, the work that Friends of the Chicago River have done in cleaning up the quality of our river, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, these are all foundational um, for what is possible. And there's a handout available for you today with a synopsis of what we have achieved in just the, the short year between uh, late summer last year and, and this year. We've accomplished quite a bit, and there's quite a bit more to do. So the vision is a result of an extensive outreach. What we did was we listened to many Chicagoans, more than 6,000 online, through lots of different uh, listening sessions in person. We had events at storefronts, in park field houses, on kayaks, um, barges, wherever people wanted to talk and dream together about uh, their riverfronts. And your message was really clear. What Chicagoans said was that they had three uh, goals. They wanted the rivers to be inviting, productive, and living. And simply put, they just wanted to be by the water. That's what Chicagoans want. So earlier this year, when the Chicago Community Trust put out a call for proposals from neighborhood organizations, they were excited to see that more than 40 applicants stepped forward. And these ranged from uh, ideas for a walking history museum on how the Native Americans portaged the river, to investments to dramatically increase river access down at Altgeld Gardens along the Calumet on the southeast side. Nine of those uh, great ideas have been already been funded in the first wave of Chicago Community Trust, Our Great Rivers grants. And riverfront development, which you'll get a chance to hear about very shortly from our panel, is a huge part of opening up public access to our riverfronts. So this idea of productive and inviting and living is something that each of the panelists have done their part um, to bring to life. 
I want to show you just uh, one uh, uh, rendering, which I think brings to life Daniel Burnham's uh, motto of make no small plans, as well as the Chicago Architecture Biennial's uh, theme of make new plans. We are trying here with our riverfronts truly to do both. And the, our Great River's vision um, is brought to life through these incredible renderings by Carol Ross Barney. We're proud that Carol is a board member of MPC and her firm um, did some incredible work um, like this one. Um, this is a picture of the South Branch of the Chicago River, river which is disconnected, but this vision here is to connect um, through Riverfront Trail, Pedestrian Bridge, a former industrial site that's uh, near 31st and Ashland, becoming both river-oriented and transit-oriented development, which would be an asset to residents on both sides of the river. Access to the state-of-the-art rowing facility that was designed at Eleanor Street by Jeannie Gang. And so this is just one example, but it really brings to life the maxim that great design with authentic community engagement can really propel progress. So the River Edge Ideas Lab was Mayor Manuel's next uh, big idea and request. And we were excited to be invited to be part of that and we were also a little daunted. Um, the idea was uh, to invite nine world-class architectural firms to uh, come forth with ideas about what was possible. And what we've done here is to listen to uh, the, the, the possibilities at some pretty complicated sites. What would you do to open up public access behind the Lyric Opera Building uh, under Congress Parkway and in an area that's a gap from where the Ping Tom Park ends in Chinatown and some of the new developments are, are uh, coming up out of the ground. The only directive from the mayor and from the Department of Planning and Development was make public access a reality and assume that a continuous riverfront trail is, um, is the dream that we are wanting to make more down payments on uh, continuously. So when you visit this River Ideas Lab, which is open now through uh, right after the holidays, you'll understand this potential. We want to inspire, not just those of you in this room, but all of Chicago, that this, our final frontier, is possible. If we have inspired stewardship, if we think big, and if we have the kind of investment behind these ideas. So your feedback is sought, um, both tonight and uh, in person at the lab or online. You can visit all of the designs at shyriverlab.com. And here's one teaser from the lab. This is a stunning image by Sasaki, one of the nine firms, and it shows an in-river pool and a farmer's market. And this is just one example uh, of literally 27 amazing ideas that I think will knock your socks off and give you a sense of how we can be creative segment by segment um, as we continue to build out the core to reach neighborhoods where there's been uh, improvements to access and where we can connect the dots and really deliver on, on the complete vision of a continuous riverfront trail. So our panel is gonna help us understand perspectives from the design, development, architectural uh, communities, and they each have a really interesting personal stories to share. So I'm, I'm looking forward to listening with you. And we have a tremendous moderator tonight in Todd Palmer. Um, Todd is the executive director of the Chicago Architecture Biennial. Um, he's been in that role since uh, this past October. And before that, for about four and a half years, he was the head of the um, Chicago Public History, um, Chicago Public Housing um, Museum. Uh, and he's been the curator and the designer in chief of this idea, which is a, a, a new uh, concept for a museum, multifaceted to activate uh, the future site on the near west side, as well as to engage the public in this important history, which actually is intertwined with the Metropolitan Planning Council's history. And Todd is a great uh, person to be providing leadership to this um, second edition of the Chicago Architecture Biennial. He was a founding director of the multidisciplinary firm that has offices in Chicago, Paris, Barcelona, London, called Program Collective. He's played a role um, in the uh, exciting uh, outcome, if you've been to Washington, D.C. and seen the new Smithsonian um, for African American history. Um, Todd was uh, proud to be involved with that, as well as in 2008, the World Expo in Zaragoza, Spain. So he's had international 
and Chicago deep experience. Um, and we're ex very excited that his commitment to the built environment, um, to inclusivity, um, to valuing our history, but also charting a new course um, is guiding the biennial at such an exciting time. So if you haven't wandered around this building, um, I hope tonight will motivate you to do that, as well as the panel that you're about to hear from. Please join me in welcoming Todd. Uh, thank you, Mary Sue, for that very kind and generous introduction. And, and welcome to all of you um, to the Chicago Architecture Biennial. This is part of our Tuesday talk series. And um, we're very pleased to be doing this in partnership with both the Metropolitan Planning Council and the City of Chicago's uh, Department of Planning and Development. Um, I will be introducing our panel in a moment, but I, I want to be sure for those of you that may not have been part of the biennial thus far. Um, we're just really finishing our first month um, as of yesterday. Um, we've been open to the public since September 16th. Um, the biennial is the, the North America's largest um, architecture and design biennial, uh, it, meaning it, it convenes every other year and showcases the transformative global impact of creativity and innovation in the built environment with architecture sort of leading the charge. Um, this year's biennial is the second. The first was in 2015. I think it's very important to note that we are housed here in the Chicago Cultural Center and part of that is that because the biennial in 2015 grew out of the city's cultural plan, which was an initiative of uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, um, executed and implemented and envisioned by uh, then Commissioner Michelle Boone of, of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. Um, and it was really important to think about how Chicago could take advantage of its assets in the built environment and architecture and really benefit the city at large by, but also reestablishing and reasserting its uh, centrality to the world. So this year our curators are the husband and wife team of Sharon Johnston and Mark Lee. Um, they run a firm out in Los Angeles known as Johnston Mark Lee and they have invited 141 architects and artists to participate and you will see their works um, for the most part um, in every corner of this building from the most grand um, Yates Hall up on the fourth floor to um, some random corners and hallways that they've re-envisioned as immersive spaces. But we're also, importantly, out in the neighborhoods. Um, so we have 25 um, different countries represented in the biennial, but the off-sites include Garfield Park Conservatory on the west side, uh, the City Gallery at Water Tower, and we're also really proud with the aid of the Chicago Community Trust to be at six neighbor, uh, neighborhood cultural institutions, ranging from the DuSable on the south side to the National Museum for Puerto Rican Art and Culture on the west side, and, and quite a few others. So it's, it's a celebration of architecture that welcomes in all of Chicago um, to be part of the world. Uh, we also have over 250 partner programs and exhibitions, and it, we're very pleased that the nearest and most neighboring is actually this uh, River Edge Ideas Lab. So just cross the street um, to Expo 72. Um, and I wanted just to, before I introduce the panelists, just point out um, the kind of synergies that we're really delighted are taking place. Um, because the, the goal of the biennial, uh, Mary Sue mentioned public access, and in many ways, it's to give public better access to the kind of conversations and, and issues happening in the field of architecture. Um, so if you, before you go across the street, as I know you will do, um, you'll run into these two exhibits that I have pictured on the screen. And on the uh, top image, um, Barco Leibinger, which is a young firm out of Berlin, is looking at social housing, or what we call public housing, not only as a site for thinking about how to house um, the most needy, but also places where we could be experimenting with different ways of building and, and different um, materials, and, and also thinking about how that 
um, intersects with the labor force and, and jobs and economies. So this really holistic idea of housing as a site of experimentation um, gets at also an infrastructure that's overlooked. Um, and we're going to be talking about this river infrastructure that's been overlooked in the city for quite some time. Um, on the bottom image um, is, a, is 51 for NE, who are Belgian architects, who have been working in Tirana, Albania. And um, it's a little difficult to see, but if you go on the first floor to the dance studio, there's these immersive videos. And it's really reconstructing um, a traffic circle that's a legacy of not so good city planning. It was polluted, it was, there's fascist and communist sort of overlays of this public space, or what wasn't really a public space. So they, they tell the story of how the public came together to reclaim this infrastructure, and now it's a wonderful park and, and plaza, and you can actually, um, these chairs are, are samples of uh, custom designs for that plaza, and you'll see a piece of the plaza actually on display here in Chicago. We're very delighted, actually, that not only did the architects come from Belgium, but the mayor of Tirana was here. Um, a month ago as part of our opening and he got to meet our mayor, Rahm Emanuel. And so the idea of the, uh, that Chicago is this center that a mayor from Albania would want to share how they've overtaken infrastructure and then crossing the street, see how we are rethinking our infrastructure. This is a really exciting thing that, that we're, that it's taking place every two years. So tonight I'm gonna introduce you to the people who are leading the conversation about how we bring new thinking, um, new history, to an un overlooked piece of Chicago's historic infrastructure and to reimagine it as a second coast and as the river edge. Um, after I introduce them, they'll join me on the stage and present some of their thinking and then we'll engage in a discussion that brings the public, I hope, into this conversation as well. So let me begin with uh, Commissioner David Reifman. Um, uh, David Reifman was appointed Commissioner of the Department of Planning and Development in August 2015. He's a native Chicagoan and responsible for leading the department's housing, economic development, zoning, and land use, land use bureaus while fostering community improvement projects throughout the city. As commissioner, um, Reifman directs the city of Chicago's efforts to foster economic development, affordable housing, and strategic planning in collaboration with elected officials, sister agencies, and community stakeholders. His priorities include the modernization of the city, city's industrial land use policies, the implementation of its transit-oriented development regulations, and the coordination of all its affordable housing policies. He's also involved in planning for the Obama Presidential Library, new development along the Chicago River, reactivating urban infrastructure for new uses, revitalizing business corridors in the neighborhoods, and many other initi initiatives that foster sustainable development and equitable investment throughout the city. Um, Reifman grew up in Rogers Park, just one north neighborhood north of me in Edgewater, on the north side, attended Sullivan High School, and earned his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Illinois. Uh, he received his law degree from Northwestern University. John A. Buck II founded the John Buck Company in 1981 and serves as its chairman. Mr. Buck is responsible for the overall strategic direction of the firm and its resources. He also leads JBC's board of directors and is a member of the firm's investment committee. Throughout his career, he has served the community through numerous civic boards and committees. In addition to the John Buck Company Foundation, which focuses on at-risk children and families within the Chicago metro area, Mr. Buck has served on the Metropolitan Planning Council, the Civic Committee of the Commercial Club of Chicago, the Lyric Opera, San Miguel Schools, and the Big Shoulders Fund. Uh, he received his BA from the University of Notre Dame, a JD from the University of Texas Law School, and an, and an MBA from the Wharton School of Business and Finance. Aaron Levin Carbonargi serves as the Director of Development Services for Sterling Bay, a Chicago-based commercial real estate investment and development firm focusing on the adaptive reuse of downtown loft office buildings, ground up office and retail developments, and urban campus build to suit projects. Prior to joining Sterling Bay in 2015, she served as the executive director 
of Chicago's Public Building Commission and delivered nearly $3 billion of new development, major renovation, security, technology, and asset repositioning work. Prior to her public service, Erin worked on commercial office, retail, and institutional projects through OWPP Architects and the Architects Partnership. She received her Bachelor of Environmental Design from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and a Master of Architecture from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And not last or least, but uh, Philip Inquist is recently retired leader of S uh, Skidmore Owings and Merrill, or SOM's Global City Design Practice, one of the world's most awarded urban planning groups. Philip and his studios have improved the quality and efficiency of city living on five continents by creating location unique strategic designs that integrate nature and urban density within a framework of future focused public infrastructure. The scale of his design perspective continues to expand from innovating sustainable urban forms that enhance city living with walkable transit and transit-enabled districts that are humanized by their natural amenities to rapidly changing urban clusters within regional ecosystems like North America's Great Lakes Basin and China's Bohai Rim. Uh, the Chicago Tribune named him and his studios Chicagoans of the Year in Architecture, citing the, the city-friendly designs of Phil and Chris. So I'd like to invite all of you up to the stage and we'll try not to bump into each other, so I'll stand here and sit down last. Um, and we'll all share a bit about how you have, um, the roles you've all played in leading the city's development of its river edges. Oh. <laughs> So many, so many things I have to do. So I guess we're going in this order. You got a clicker? Okay. Can you hear me? Hello? Yep. Great. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. I'm David Reifman. I'm the Commissioner of Planning and Development. I'd like to thank Mary Sue, um, Todd, and my fellow panelists. I'm very happy to be here tonight. Um, and before I start, I'd just like to take a moment. I would be remiss if I did not uh, recognize the hardworking staff of the Department of Planning and Development, many of whom are here this evening. So if you would all just stand for one moment to be acknowledged for your, your hard work. There's more of you out there. Thank you. Great. So what I would like to do is I, I'm going to try to frame the conversation from my perspective. Um, looking at both what I think are the importance of both public investments and private investments um, in the riverfront. And, and it begins, from my perspective, with the mayor's vision. And, and in the beginning of his term, his first term early on, he, he sort of made an off-the-cuff remark about how the river would be our next recreational frontier. You know, little did he realize at the time that this would kind of cascade into a, an, an enormous undertaking, beginning um, primarily with um, the work that occurred at the Riverwalk, the main branch of the river. Um, and the mayor's, you know, vision at that time was, you know, he, he was able to secure a, a very important federal loan. We were able to kind of commercialize the river, and, and I think everyone sees the results on the south side of the main branch of the Chicago River, and here you see a little bit of the activity that went into the, the public improvements along the Chicago River for which we've won many awards. We have two million annual visitors. Um, we've seen exponential increases in concession sales and new construction along the banks. Um, I think one of the, the interesting things that has occurred, which was occurring, but I think we recognize it quite a bit more, is the level of private investment that has accompanied this public investment on both sides of the river, but primarily if you're watching on the north side of the river. So um, I begin a little bit with uh, you know the Vista Tower, Jeannie Gang's project um, along the river, which is on the south side, but then we have the new Apple Store, one of the um, 
one of the four flagship Apple stores in the, in the world that is opening this week along the Chicago River. We see 300 North LaSalle, a Heinz development that's occurred. Um, Wolf Point, which is continuing to develop. Um, 444 West Lake, another Heinz development further west um, on the river. And um, again, 110 North Wacker Drive, actually I should have flipped here, there's the projects themselves, each of which has been, you know, kind of validated the um, necessity and the importance of the river um, as a brand new approach to development. We all recognize the role the lake has played historically, but the river is somewhat new, and I think we're gonna start seeing much more along the north side of the river continuing um, downtown. Now, this has taken us into different directions as downtown pressure has increased um, and we've seen growth. And one of the things that we've undertaken in our initiatives was the revisiting of the North Branch um, Industrial Corridor. Now, this exercise that we undertook over the last year or so, um, the North Branch is one of 26 industrial corridors. It's 750 acres between basically Kinsey and Fullerton. And again, the primary purpose of our, of our exercise and our, our initiative was to look at how to redevelop this land for 21st century jobs-rich environments. But as importantly, this is the entire North Branch of the Chicago River. And the opportunity that that redevelopment represents for enhancing the river and its stature um, as we create these jobs generating environments. As we go a little bit further north, um, the mayor recently um, announced, I'm gonna go back one second actually. Um, now Erin here is here representing Sterling Bay and she'll talk a little bit more about Finkel, but we see the Trib site, the Troop site, which the city owns and has recently um, sold, we're in the process of selling, for about $105 million given the development activity, which will allow us to leverage neighborhood development in a couple different ways, including a new fleet and facilities headquarters on the south side in Englewood, new public safety, um, a new public safety facility on the west side for training facilities for our first responders, and 311 upgrades. So again, this is just one element of how the river has played a role in redevelopment of the city. Now, as we move further up, I think, again, the North Branch has taken on this importance, and we have, again, new initiatives. Um, the mayor recently announced the 312 River Run, uh, which broke ground this month, which will connect three of our major parks in this area, and again, connect to the Clark Boathouse um, further north um, along, along the river. Um, now, as we move south along the river, I think what we're seeing is tremendous development activity in a way that I don't think any of us really saw maybe a decade ago, I'll let John speak more to these ideas. He, you know, he's had so much um, of a hand in everything we've seen develop in Chicago. But you see this new frontier for private and public investment as we move south. The $600 million investment in the old post office, which is coming along, is a riverfront development. The $1.5 billion investment in Riverline, which is 3,700 dwelling units with six acres of open space. The property, the 62 acres controlled by Related at Roosevelt and Clark, with tremendous opportunity which could house up to 10 million square feet over the next 20 years and maybe $5 billion of development. So as we looked at all of this type of activity occurring, and the mayor specifically um, was very, very concerned that we as a department and we as a city, that we look at all of this private investment and all these things that we're doing from a public perspective um, and make sure that we are addressing the issues of public access, of, of kind of thematic uh, integrity of the riverfront. Not that every um, different condition would be identical because that would not be what we want either, but that we have that we have kind of a seamless integration of the river and big ideas on how we did it. That was the origin of the River Edge Ideas Lab. And what you're seeing here are, are three of the examples of the 27 examples which you can see across the street. The Civic Opera House, which is Sasaki's design, where streets cross the river at Congress. Here we have Studio Gang's design. And finally, where bridges are located above the water at the St. Charles Airline Bridge which is David Adige's um, firm's design. And you'll see, you can see all of them across the street. And again, with the help of the public, with the developers and all these investments, what we're hoping to do is have a set of integrated guidelines, approaches to make sure that the public's interest is served at the same time we see this unprecedented um, private investment along the river as it's reborn as our second frontier. So that's what I'd like to start by framing it. I'll hand it over to John at this point.
Hello? Okay. Which way is forward? So I was asked by uh, Mary Sue to talk about what uh, sparked my interest in the river. I moved here from Texas in 1971 to work on the Sears Tower. And there was a very beautiful lady who in her later years gave a lecture series, sponsored a lecture series every Monday in April. And one of those Mondays for during lunch. And the gentleman who came, I went to every one of them when I was quite young and he was instrumental in forming this dirty ditch in uh, San Antonio uh, to what is now very well regarded uh, riverfront. And I started thinking to myself about the Chicago River and in the late 80s, I worked with Jonathan Boyer and Heidi Hopper and uh, Beth White of 606 and Open Lands uh, uh, f uh, f uh, fame, and she at that time was the friend, was the director of the Friends of the River. So we developed a plan, and Jonathan and Heidi executed that plan to develop a river walk connecting uh, Chinatown to uh, Lake Michigan. And we spent about a year and a half on that and dealt with many segments of government, including the Corps of Engineers, and now it is, it is happening. And we presented this in 1990 to Mayor Sawyer. And uh, now it's halfway there. So, and then uh, subsequent to that, I was able to uh, build a, an office building at uh, Wacker and, uh, and Adams on the river with Harry Weiss who was a delightful architect to work with. And uh, we came up with a scheme to use the Chicago River and to also develop a pocket park, a very small park, on Quincy Street. Well, Quincy Street hardly exists anymore. Sears bought the street. Uh, and before that, the federal government condemned the street between Dearborn and Clark to build the federal center but it is still a public street. So in Chicago at that time, you could, uh, if you set back the ground floor of your office building, you could acquire more air rights to build a higher density. And we actually were on three streets, Adams and Wacker and Quincy. So Harry went to the then commissioner of planning and said, well, wait a minute, we're really on four streets. We're actually on the river. Well, that doesn't count. Well, he made it count, and so a legislation was passed. So, so we have a setback there. And then my inspiration for Quincy Park really was Paley Park on 53rd Street in New York City, which is a very delightful oasis. And for the 27 years that we owned 200 South Wacker and uh, so forth, we, we used that park quite extensively. Jane Byrne was the mayor when she gave us permission to build the park on public land, but the, the manager of the park would be the owner of that building. So that's how that evolved. And then we, we developed the first uh, private sector uh, taxi stop on the river, which was really to service Sears Tower, but that's why we did that. So that's, that's how that evolved. And over time, it became apparent to me that uh, my now hometown, Chicago, uh, has many, many advantages. But one of those advantages is the Chicago River, which I always thought could be used for uh, transportation. Of late, we've explored, we've explored many, many paths. And Phil Inquist can talk about the ones above land. But the ones on the river, I thought that we could, you know, the river we have now, what, 150 miles of river or something like that that are usable, and so maybe we can create bicycle paths on the river, things of that sort to help people get in and out of the loop. So that's more or less my history of the river here. Well, thank you. 
On behalf of uh, Andy Glor and all the gang at Sterling Bay, I'm thrilled to be here among this distinguished panel. Uh, particularly grateful to Mary Sue and the whole team at MPC and Commissioner Reifman, uh, particularly for moving some of the legislation he has to make the riverfront productive, inviting, and open, and, um, but also, and, and more importantly, retaining the tremendous professionals and his staff that share that same vision that bring us all over the finish line to make this one of the cities that people really want to live, work, and play. Uh, really thrilled to be on this particular panel for two reasons. One, uh, the Biennale in Venice is one that I frequent often and just thrilled to be uh, supportive of the mayor and Michelle's vision to bring the Biennale to Chicago. It is such a wonderful opportunity to expose folks to something that uh, may be in their backyard but not realizing it's one of the things that is a tremendous draw to Chicago for visitors and tourism alike. Um, and secondly, we're sponsoring or help, helping to partner with um, Skidmore on a venue in the Fulton Market District next to the Ace Hotel that is a retrospective of structural engineering as part of SOM's history. And it's just been a thrill to be engaged in that. Um, my personal history involving the river, when I got peaked and my interest got peaked, um, and, and frankly my dismay was peaked in how we don't engage in the river, was when uh, Mayor Daly and ultimately Mayor Emanuel helped to sponsor, fund, and ultimately bring over the finish line, the Leonard Louis Fieldhouse down in Chinatown. And taking the water taxi that John and his team brought to life down there um, and discovering something that, frankly, I had not discovered and now has become a mainstay in my children and, and my husband's and our lives is taking the water taxi down and grabbing some dim sum from time to time and stopping there. And so embracing that mode of transit, embracing that part of our Chicago heritage is something that has become deeply embedded into certainly how I practice and um, hopefully what, what we're going to be able to do at Sterling Bay as we move forward. So I'm really excited to share with you some of the things that we're thinking and actually implementing at this point. And uh, despite what I tell my children, I don't have eyes in the back of my head. So forgive me if my slides are not fully sequenced with what I'm going to share with you. Uh, the first project I wanted to share with you a little bit about uh, is the C.H. Robinson headquarters. Um, it's really exciting for us because it is an exemplar of business and productivity in Chicago. C.H. Robinson, as many of you may be aware, is a global logistics headquarters. We are building a 207,000 square foot regional headquarters for this company. They're best in class. Um, they are the leaders in this space of third party logistics. And they have shared with me on more than uh, a dozen uh, occasions from inception and programming through the execution of what is now a wonderful building that will be brought online uh, mid-2018, that Chicago is their recruiting tool. They go to all the universities and they have a hard time filling their position, but by bringing them to Chicago and entertaining folks with all of the great things that Chicago has to offer, that is what really brings their staff to work for C.H. Robinson. And it's been really rewarding to be able to bring that vision uh, to fruition. And so for us, what we're excited by, and we've engaged Skidmore Owings and Merrill and Site Design Group on the landscape, is how do we embrace this site and make it something that's open and accessible to the public and C.H. Robinson alike. Um, as with any riverfront and bridge adjacent property, uh, we struggle with the topography, we struggle with the uh, grade change, we struggle with the access points, but frankly, our biggest challenges ultimately become our biggest opportunities for what will be cool and engaging space to get people down to the river and ultimately connect, we hope, to the central business district itself. Um, we are just absolutely thrilled and we think that we're gonna be in a position uh, mid next year to bring on board just some really wonderful opportunities that you'll see with C.H. Robinson. Um, and then the second project I wanted to share with you are some of the ideas that surround the master planning initiatives that we've undertaken on behalf of the uh, Finkel and surrounding properties. So we fully embraced and thank the commissioner for what he's done um, and Eleanor's leadership in the North Branch framework. We really 
are um, just humbled to be able to work within that kind of a framework that's so forward thinking, so transit oriented, so deeply rooted in sustainability provisions, talking about centralized parking, talking about walkability, livability, in how we engage the widening of streets to allow for sidewalk cafes, to, to engage the river, to make it accessible and uh, allow for points of contact in each uh, street and between buildings and really allowing that verdant vibrancy that we know can be the Chicago River that unfortunately cur currently isn't there. Um, Sterling Bay has had the great privilege of being able to assemble over 40 acres rooted in uh, a tannery, yuck, uh, you know, a metal uh, recycling. Uh, Finkel, believe it or not, did not use any petroleum solvents within their forging. And so that's a relatively clean site, but there's so much where we as Chicagoans and particularly with our industry turned our backs on the river and dumped in the river. And so it's really heartening to be able to um, be part of and celebrate the engagement with the river, whether it be kayaking or supporting Friends of the River and um, the, the work of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District and what they're doing with the EPA to clean up the river and make it something that you can canoe on and you can fall in um, and, and not be particularly worried. Um, I've done that, sadly. Uh, I was a little worried, but you know, what we, we, <laughs> what we love about uh, Chicago so much in our, in our lakefront is what we need to embrace and we're excited to embrace as we move forward with what we're planning. Um, so I wanna share with you, obviously you see the existing site itself. Uh, there's so much potential. There's so many feet of, of riverfront. And what we have the ability, because we surround both sides, we not only are riverfront, but we are river surrounding on both sides with both the Sims Metal Manufacturing Site and Finkel as well. And as Commissioner Reefman mentioned, under contract to purchase the uh, fleet facility too, to be able to have the most amount of impact on the development and really embrace the way that people access the riverfront, um, but also multi-modes of transit. Because you have the metro, you've got the red line, the brown line, the blue line out to O'Hare. We're 20 minutes from O'Hare. We're in a position where people can live, work, and play all within a very tight vicinity and make it a very livable and walkable community. And we're anxious to do that. But the productivity aspect of it and bringing jobs uh, and headquarters to Chicago is something that Sterling Bay is very proud to lead the charge on with Google and now McDonald's. And we know that this is the next frontier in terms of bringing jobs and bringing productivity. C.H. Robinson, that development is retaining 2,000 jobs. Imagine what Amazon and others can do for the city of Chicago. And so uh, we're thrilled to be able to envision and hope and dream uh, that this is in fact the next frontier for Chicago. And so just thrilled to be a part of it and uh, grateful to be here and uh, share with you ultimately and hopefully in years to come some of the big ideas like connecting the 606 uh, through, I don't know what slide I'm showing you. Yep, that's the 606 one. Uh, connecting the 606 through, but more importantly in every endeavor, making sure that people can touch the river, get close to the river, be part of it, and, and let that unique and interesting topographical change, those level changes that are river adjacent and bridge adjacent, uh, be something really interesting for, uh, for Chicago and for all of us that call it home. Okay, well, uh, like Aaron, I'm very thankful to be on a panel like this. It's uh, great to be included, so thank you all for inviting me. And I think that uh, any Chicagoan is passionate about the river, but there is a remarkable transformational moment right now where we're seeing this tired industrial river shift to a paddling river uh, more kayaks on the river this summer than I've ever seen, and it's moving back to a paddle river again. It was a long time ago, and it's becoming this amazing, uh, as the mayor says, uh, Chicago's uh, next great park. And uh, personally, I've been involved with the river for 
I think 22 years uh, in planning initiatives on the river with the city mostly. Uh, but my firm's been involved uh, in ideas around the river for the last maybe 60 years uh, with some very bold ideas. Uh, and it was all about bringing people back to the water's edge and raising the awareness of this river as an asset, not a liability. And, uh, and now we're seeing that really really happen. So what I wanted to do today is talk more about the ecology of the river and less about the development opportunities because we see it now as a preferred address. We see the investment, as Aaron just showed uh, and John mentioned, of uh, development clearly wanting to be a part of the river. Uh, and we're seeing it as a transportation corridor as well. But I wanted to spend my few minutes talking about the importance of the river ecology. And working with Friends of Downtown and Open Lands and MPC and listening to Josh Ellis at multiple lunches, um, <laughs> working with David St. Pierre at MWRD, there's a common ground here, a real interest in reconnecting the broken chains of the ecology of the river. The way we built the city, the way we create energy, the way we move people has all broken the chains of ecology and we're starting to repair those. And so for this 150 mile length of river that Mary Sue mentioned or the 700 square miles of watershed, we we can really improve the, the ecology. So uh, this image is just really to show the importance of this river as an asset and address in the core of the city. But uh, John happened to mention the San Antonio River Walk, which was a very dead uh, river and back door, and it's become not only an asset uh, to the city, but it's become a very healthy river, too, with efforts to... Uh, bring oxygen into the water and wetlands into the water. And um, I'm not sure what else I, oh, in, uh, in China, we, we do a lot of work on river edges in China. Kan Jin Yu is a Beijing architect that's re reinventing uh, wetland habitats and biofiltration and changing the aesthetic of landscape so that it actually restores water quality, uh, as you see in this slide. And, and then I think there's also this um, amazing opportunity to be innovative on the river. Uh, the slide on the right is Robert Smithson. Maybe 30 years ago, he invented this uh, barge garden that got towed around New York City uh, to show that you could create a park on the water. And Tom Leader's uh, raft on or barge on the on the left is really an idea today about how a barge filters water and improves water quality. Uh, and so I think this idea of maybe having UI labs on the river uh, where they can invent and manufacture, uh, we could actually be inventing a whole new kind of infrastructure that is uh, also a public amenity but is, is helping to improve uh, the quality of the water. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of efforts to take industrial waterways and expand the wetland contact with water by creating uh, additional islands or channels and increasing the frontage of land to water by, by three times, by four times. So you can increase wetland planting, it improves fish habitat, turtle habitat, uh, and, and uh, takes toxins out of the the water. So we're very interested in this particular idea and we applied it oops, in, uh, in some of the designs we submitted to the MPC River Edge uh, competition. So this is down at Ping Tom Park where the river is a little bit wider and we have a large public park and we actually proposed uh, adding uh, a linear island that created a kayak uh, corridor, so a more protected uh, place for kayaks, but it also increased the wetland planting by three times. So that we're able in every project we do to improve the quality of water. Uh, also under Congress Parkway, uh, what we were proposing is by creating simple uh, windmill 
driven pumps, you could pump some of the Chicago River water up and let it spill back down and aerate so that you get oxygen back in the river. Because one of the big challenges of the river through downtown is there's very little oxygen in the water to support uh, aquatic life. And then at uh, the Opera House, what was interesting to us there is we actually felt we could still get wetland planting in, but it's really a intersection of all these people coming off the trains, moving across the river at street level, and then if the river level is connecting from the lake all the way to Ping Tom Park, uh, you have the ability to connect river level and street level with all the commuters moving across Madison and Washington. So you have uh, 200,000 people that you're dealing with in the morning and the afternoon. That the river walk is providing people a whole new way to move through the city. And then my closing slide, not, not to end on a grim note, but all these rivers <laughs> add up. So the Chicago River now drains to the Mississippi. The Mississippi comes down to the Gulf of Mexico. So this map is just really the watershed of the full uh, North America continent and how all these rivers together uh, create the biggest dead zone uh, on the planet in the Gulf of Mexico. And we keep putting waste in rivers, and I think that we're at this transformational moment, not just in terms of the Chicago River, but how we look at living in balance with our ecology. And I think that Chicago is doing a great job improving the health of its river, and if everybody does this down that line, we won't have that yellow zone, uh, and that we won't be seeing waste as something we just put in the water, but we actually see waste as an asset we reuse. So that's where I hope we're going. Thank you. Okay, so I'm really eager to jump into this conversation with you, David, John, Aaron, and Phil. But, but, but before we do, just want to recognize that we will have an opportunity to bring all of you in the audience, we're not all of you, as many of you as we can. The, the challenge is we can't bring all of you, so um, the staff from DPD as well as some from the biennial will have cards for you, and just raise your hand and we'll take as many questions as we can at the end. So jumping in to kind of the question of what makes this historic? And the biennial, the theme obviously is make new history. And one of the things I think that happens when you see, for example, up in Yates, that in 1922, there wasn't a Tribune Tower. It was this moment that a competition was held and there were forces at play that made it possible for Chicago to create this great monument. But it, didn't exist. So perhaps we're at this pivotal moment with the river edge. Um, and I'm curious from your, from all of your diverse perspectives, why now? What's, why is this happening? And, and, and perhaps you could also think about what, what prevented, why, why didn't it happen before? We'll start maybe with Commissioner Reifman. I, well, I don't know that I can say exactly why now, other than you know a little bit of vision by the mayor in terms of its recreational potential. But I do think in terms of the um, the type of, um, one of the things the mayor asked me to do when I took this job was to undertake real review of our industrial policies and industrial modernization. And clearly, you know, I think people have pointed out, I think Aaron mentioned it, the historical role of the river that, you know, C.H. Robinson's, the, you know, the old Gutman Tannery site, and turning our river from kind of the, the back door in, in, in our sewer to a true amenity. And with the change in our industrial evolution, we have to re really reinvent the river as a different type of asset. So from a historical perspective and consistent with the, the theme of the biennial, that, that's really how I see. How are we really reinventing the river's role um, throughout our entire city? Anyone else have a sense of why now? I think, uh, and the commissioner is absolutely right, um, so much of this is an evolution though. As we see um, the plant manufacturing districts were meant to protect the blue collar jobs that were adjacent and protect those manufacturing, those jobs, those households have moved and uh, those 
industries have moved well before Mayor Emanuel was in office. And so being able to adapt to today is this moment in time that could easily be, could easily lay fallow and could not have been um, captured and, and engaged the way it has been. But the energy around this is particularly amazing. I mean, it's palpable in our office throughout the nation as you talk to folks on peer groups and ULI and other places because Chicago is one of the few pe places where, and, and Mayor Emanuel is one of the few mayors that truly engage, adapt, and pivot based upon now mm -hmm. and based upon um, the realization that ecological environmental sustainability is also economic sustainability and that people want to live, work, and play in places that make them feel good. Mm -hmm. They may not be able to define what makes them feel good, but they know it when they see it. And I think it is now that we need to capture it. And, and I truly applaud the administration for being able to do so and do it now and do it so nimbly and so quickly. Chicago gets a bad rap for Al Capone to whatever, you know, but the reality is this city issues permits faster, issues zoning changes faster than any place else in the nation. And to be able to change this kind of monumental legislation to embrace uh, job creation is tremendous. I think it's also the uh, changing dynamics of, of the central area. Uh, many more people live here than even a decade ago, certainly 20 years ago. Uh, and more and more people are coming here. I mean, there's so much housing under construction. And to support a 24-hour community here, you need a different uh, set of or collection of public amenities and open spaces. And I think uh, the river has to play a bigger role now that so many people are living uh, in and around downtown. John, any, how about the, the other side of it? Why not before? Were there forces or, that prevented this kind of thing from happening? Well, things took time. I mean, it was a quarter of a century ago before we did that study. I mean, um, things just take time. And uh, the city of Chicago is so much different than it was when I moved here in 1971. And uh, the world is different, and people are paying much more attention to the CBD and uh, the, the uh, opportunities that exist for commuting also have become much more important. Trying to get people off the automobile into the CTA, walking, running, bicycling, it's, it's just a different town, so. We're gonna get in a little bit into some of the specifics, but I, I wanna kinda talk to you now about the big picture. So we have this, this term, the second coast, um, and it suggests you know, something pretty, well, not global, but coastal, like pretty comprehensive. So what does that mean to you? What, what, what can we expect to see kind of big picture um, when, we, when we think about a second coast of the city? I don't know who came up with that term. It doesn't really mean anything to me, really. <laughs> uh, Jesus, you know, it's a river. <laughs> it's, a, it's not a second coast. Uh, so no comment. Okay. <laughs> well, well, I'll take it then. So um, <laughs> I, I, I think it's more, I do go back when you look at the, you know, my recollection of the history of Chicago and development in Chicago is the importance of, you know, the lake and the, what the lake represented for development of high rise, of views, of what the, you know, the, of our main waterfront. And in terms of a second coast, I do think that when I, when I look at all the development that is coming through here, we're seeing, you know, if we, you know, each one of these sites in, you know, generally in control of significant, well-capitalized, visionary development teams, whether it's the related companies or 601 West or CMK and Lendlease or, or the Tribune or, or Sterling Bay or whoever it may be, you're seeing this kind of, you know, re imagining of the river in a way that we used to imagine the lake. It doesn't diminish the importance of the lake, and, and the lake does remain our first and most important calling card from an architectural perspective, everything, all the views of Chicago off the lake. But now we have this second vision. So I don't know about coast, but I, I do think this is, um, this, is a, 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 this is gaining momentum and will continue to gain momentum as we see 
literally billions of dollars of investment along the river in the way we would see billions of dollars of investment previously along the, the lake. How about from an ecological perspective? What is the, the coast, the two coasts, how do they in scale compare in terms of their importance or is it, is it a parity? Well, I, I, I kind of agree with John. I, I don't see it as a coast, I see it as a, as a river. Uh, but uh, there's some very interesting experiments going on right now with uh, uh, ecological studies. This uh, young group, Urban Rivers, uh, put these floating wetland islands. They collaborated with the city and uh, put these islands, after I think five years of trying to get this thing to work, uh, now on the east side of Goose Island, uh, they were planted in May, they're all floating, the roots go through and into the water, and now they're, they're just beautiful. Uh, and they create habitat and they clean water. And uh, on the main river walk uh, that uh, Carol was so involved with, there are rooms that have wetland plantings. And it, I think these are the beginning of really thinking about how to soften these hard urban edges and find ways, I mean really, from now on, every building built on the river just shouldn't do a vertical wall. You know, you should step the wall, you should allow for, uh, allow for wetland planting. Uh, vertical walls don't really help the health of the river. Aaron, you talked a bit about calling cards, and I mean, I, we can actually, dispute whether this is the second coast, because I've heard it said that Chicago is the third coast. So I'm, I'm curious, right? There's an east and a west and a third. But just from your perspective, how does this, this coast tie into the appeal of the city for people coming in? Third coast, second city, I feel like we've got an inferiority complex that we need to really address. But um, it, is, it is first and foremost one of the best cities in the nation, number one, and that has a lot to do with the river and, and the lake. And the reality is we are not subject to tidal flows, the up and down. We are far more protected in the center of the nation from any kind of climatic change or, or other things that, um, that require quite frankly, a more um, intricate um, design process that keeps away the water. We're in such an advantageous position that we can welcome the water in different ways as we embrace the ecology that Phil is mentioning. There are even fish hatcheries that are within by the river walk and the CBD. Um, just to be able to witness a lot of that development and, and look at how folks embrace the river is, um, is tremendous. Whether you call it a coast or a frontier, uh, it, it's one of the great opportunities I think we have beyond the lake that is really an attractive uh, component if we embrace it and really capitalize on it the, the way we should. Um, I, I have very distinct memories of hosting, you know, the Chicago hosting NATO and before at the Olympic bid, uh, where people came to Chicago with mouths agape, not realizing how big our lake is, that you can't see the other side, and that we have such an expansive network of rivers and, and the ability to access the rivers that I think it is one of those features of Chicago that make us the best, not the third or the second. <laughs> you, you know, the one, the one we, we haven't mentioned the role that uh, the Chicago Architectural Foundation has played in this too. They're, they're, uh, architectural crews on the river, I think has done so much to raise awareness of the river, not just in the Chicago region and nationally, but really internationally. And it, it's a phenomenal <laughs> asset. So as much as we love Chicago, <laughs> um, part of the biennial is about this exchange of bringing the world here and, and even, gosh, we can learn things from the world too. So uh, both um, uh, John and Phil m mentioned San Antonio, for example, and I'm curious, looking at the world, at, at other cities, whether in the United States or abroad, are there things that other cities have done or are doing that you find 
interesting in terms of river development, ecologically, real estate, uh, reclamation, whatever. I can add one thing that we, um, uh, when I was with the Public Building Commission, we built a school, first LEED certified school in the city of Chicago. Well, not on the river, it was on uh, Marquette Park Lagoon. And what we quickly learned is that a lot of our uh, water has uh, injected minerals in it that uh, are meant to keep copper pipes and other piping materials from leaching lead and other product into the water supply. But it's predominantly phosphor-based, and so a lot of that uh, began, those phosphors, which is one of the key ingredients in fertilizer, um, began an algae bloom within Marquette Park Lagoon. Um, and so strangling the wildlife, the fish life within the Marquette Park Lagoon. And so one of the things that we looked at and ultimately employed was a sheet flow of all of our stormwater so that it could go through prairie scrubbers and bioswales before that stormwater made its way into the, the lagoon itself. That is a very long-winded way, I'm sorry, of saying we need to figure out how to embrace water differently. We have a combined sanitary and storm system in the city of Chicago that is you know, insurmountable as it relates to the cost of separating those existing infrastructure components. But as we look at that particular school, another school down in Rainbow Beach, we were able to take all the storm water and uh, send it into, because it's not yet polluted by the sanitary combination, then dump it into the, the lake and ultimately that clean water is, remains clean and we're not spending energy and resources in cleaning it up. And so I think so much of what we need to do ecologically is good business. Uh, we're not polluting then only to turn around and clean and we need to really embrace and figure out how better to deal with our storm and sanitary systems in the city of Chicago. Uh, okay, uh, I think Los Angeles is struggling uh, in their efforts to uh, redesign their river, uh, which is really uh, like just a big uh, escape valve to the ocean. Uh, but it's an interesting problem. They have a 4,000 foot elevation difference from the mountains to the ocean, and so they get these huge, uh, rather uh, violent uh, rainfall flows through the city. But this concrete channel uh, has galvanized the people uh, of Los Angeles to come together. Uh, they've done lots of demonstration efforts, designs to remove the concrete, uh, let the ground be permeable, get the ground into the aquifer, create public open space. More people want to live on this. Uh, and it's going from a much worse condition than the Chicago River ever was to, and it doesn't have water all year round either, uh, to something that I think will be an asset. So I think that's an interesting model to watch. David? Uh, well, I'll add something, you know, I, you know one, of the, one of the examples, you know, the mayor worked closely with the mayor of Paris and they've talked quite a bit about the, you know, the kind of redevelopment that they want to do in Paris. I think one of the things that we can learn, you know, so a lot of the Paris riverfront is reclaimed you know, automobile, you know, automobile roads, you know, it's very controversial there. People love it, people hate it, but they have the advantages. They have this built environment already uh, where they, which I think they can commercialize better. They, if they don't maximize it in my opinion. But, you know, to kind of Phil's point earlier, one of the purposes of the River Edge Ideas Lab and one of the things that we're looking at with everything is the kind of pedestrian human, um, accessible scale of where the built environment meets the river. So in Paris, the river walk is a solid wall, right? You're really holding back a major river from flooding your city. But here we do have all these opportunities um, to create this, you know, multimodal environment, whether it's walking, biking, um, wetlands. So I think one of the things I'd love to see come out of this and lessons learned from other places is really achieving something very special with that scale. We will not have traffic in any of those developments, mean, these are all pedestrian accessible things. There's no cars or roads envisioned anywhere in any of those developments we talked about, whether it's Finkel or the 62 acres. So I would say that would be um, an important lesson learned from other places that we can really achieve something very special with what we started on the Riverwalk. 
Okay. Um, let's talk about priorities. I think, you know, design, trained as an architect, um, is, is often about weighing, we can't do everything at once. And we saw examples of, uh, you know, economic development, we've, you know, ecological development or ecological healing improvements, um, leisure ideas, um, workforce ideas. In, in your opinion, if we, if we had to prioritize in thinking about the river, what would, the, what, what would that top priority be? Um, maybe the commissioner, you want to start? I, I can't prioritize one over the other. I mean, we really have the opportunity to do all these things correct. A jobs generating environment that's amenitized, um, that also, you know, makes the river, you know, more swimmable. All these things have to work together. So um, I really think that is what we're striving to do. I don't think I would prioritize one over the other. I don't think they work without each other. I, I, I think there's a simple diagram that would be really great to achieve as soon as possible. It seems like the planets are kind of aligned for this, but from the Finkel development, and Aaron, you mentioned the 606 coming into that, and then continuous river walk access all the way down to uh, uh, Ping Tom Park, Cermak, Chinatown, and that's right around where the Paseo Trail is. That isn't the Paseo Trail in that area. Yeah, so, it's in, it's in so the both of these rail lines shifting to pedestrian ways, moving east-west, connect deeper city to the river, and then the river starts to be this really strong conduit. That that diagram with Finkel and and the related work and post office shifting and the Paseo Trail coming in and extending 606, you add all those up and that's a pretty powerful game changer, I think. So if, David, if I were you, that's what, that's what I would be <laughs> striving for. Well, I'll add that to my to-do my to list, Phil, thank you. Mm. But we, it is the mayor's vision, right, to make those connections all the way down. And there are some constraints on the river as you go further south and taking it through the Paseo and through the industrial areas of, you know, down on the southwest side. And, you know, John is a big champion of how we can, you know, link continuously along the river. You know, you can speak for it yourself. I won't speak for you, but I know we've discussed many times how do you make this really continue, you know, the mayor wants to go all the way from McCormick and, you know, you know, all the way on the far north side and bring it as far south past Ping Tom Park down to Little Village. So, you know, the vision is there is how do you execute and how do you deal with all the, there are some challenging conditions and, and, and obstacles, but the, the, the desire and the vision I think is there. I think, Todd, you're putting too much pressure on yourself. There's a lot of questions from the audience. Let's go. <laughs> They're, they're, they're still juggling them. <laughs> Are you guys almost ready? I have one more question to throw out before we get to the audience. Um, did you want to say something about priority? And that's just what the, one of the, a, a bad word would be um, a missed opportunity. And is, is there anything when we're looking at, you know, an innovative river fund that the city can do to make sure that we support innovation? <laughs> Are we ready for questions? Okay. Great. Ah. Okay. All right. I'm going to get my glasses out just in case. Yeah, good luck with <laughs> Test your handwriting skills. This many architects should have great handwriting <laughs> Okay. So how do you hide or move the industry along the north and south branches when the industry is important to the day-to-day -day life of the city? For example, the Amtrak rail yards or the concrete mills. How do you move the industry? How do you hide or move? I, I don't think you hide it. I, I think you want the industry that's there to be vibrant and, and uh, create jobs, and you want to integrate it you know, integrated in a way where it's working with a mixed-use city. And uh, there are some challenges, but I, I, th I think for the most part, and I think Goose Island's a really interesting example of this, where uh, it's, it's all becoming so mixed-use. I think industry, residential, workplace, recreations, all kind of coming together. 
Yeah, I think you embrace it. I mean, you, when you look at the North Branch plan, we begin with the various critical services. You're not going to, you know, that, that's a, still a part of everything we need to thrive on the river as well, whether it's, you know, materials providers or, or asphalt. And, you know, there are some interesting opportunities. You know, I, we, we looked at, I'm not going to speak for their owners, but, you know, you have the Tribune site next to Prairie Materials, and Prairie has those huge, um, you know, I don't know what the, what the term is, but where they store the con you know, their concrete silos. It's, it's a tremendous opportunity for, for art, for integration, for, you know, um, environment, character buildings that we have on Goose Island. I think it can work together. Um, I, I have tremendous confidence in the creativity of the Chicago architectural and development community. Those are grain elevators. I grew up with those. <laughs> they don't have concrete coming down. All right, so another question here has to do with um, that there are communities and forces, um, that, whether NIMBYs or that, that are not for development um, and, and don't want to see these sites developed. How do we get them on board to support higher density and mixed use programming as a neighborhood asset? That's a big question. That's a big question. You know, progress is progress. Uh, if uh, the world's changing, I don't, I don't know where that's going to. That question is going to take us. Well, I mean, I will say this. I think you know a lot of it has to do with engagement and how you um, really engage the community and listen to people's ideas and incorporate, you know, the best of all those worlds. I don't think it's a black and white answer. And again, you look at the North Branch or Kinsey process that we're in right now. We have you know, had dozens of meetings and opportunities to weigh in on how this should look and what it should be, and both in, in person and on the web and other things. You know, and, and Aaron and her company are gonna have to navigate that framework as they come up with development opportunities. At the end of the day, people don't wanna see all this land just sit there and devalue and do nothing. We have to find creative ways to reuse it. So I think there are strategies to you know, address the concerns. There are people who want nothing to happen and that won't be the result, but there are ways to address development and ways to address all the priorities that come with development. Density is important, open space is important, access to the river is important. There's no reason they can't all work together. I think you're gonna have, and, and echoing what the commissioner said and John said, you're gonna ultimately have NIMBYs regardless of where, whether, where you go. Every project has its naysayers, but you've gotta find the audience and you've gotta engender the trust that you're really trying to do the right thing. Not every member of the community is gonna care that I can kayak from Blue Island up to the Bai Hai Temple. Um, but I think a lot more of Chicago recognizes that our, our safety, our public safety, is rooted in vibrancy and mixed use. Eyes on the street, Jane Jacobs, you name it, we're talking about that vibrancy allowing for um, self-policing and making sure that our streets are safe and active and vibrant, um, but also that safety is deeply rooted in job creation and uh, being able to develop and bring and foster jobs in Chicago is all about um, the, the safety and the economic viability of not just our city, but our region at large. And I think hopefully that is something that strikes a chord with everyone, um, not just the, the beauty of the river and the engagement therein. Okay, this question, I th oh, do you have, Phil, I think this goes to you. Um, Chicago's lakefront and rivers are important stopovers for hundreds of thousands of migrating birds, bats, and butterflies. What is the plan for providing adequate wildlife habitat, wildlife habitat along the river's edges? Milkweed. That's right. Milkweed. No, that's good. Exactly. Yeah, milkweed is good. Well, I, I think if you, like if you just go to the Friends of the River website, they explain uh, the full range of habitat in the river already. And when you're on a boat and you see a river otter, you realize as they say, there's more than water in this river. I mean, it's really full of life. Uh, and as, as soon as we put those rafts in the, the water in May, ducks were nesting on them a week later. And I, I think you've just got to consciously expand the uh, habitat area for wildlife and keep that in the mix with everything else. I mean, 
everybody's fighting for space, but it's not just about the human being. I think we have to really understand the range of habitat and what we've lost and how to get that back. All right. This question is about how the city developers design community and public work with the federal government and the Army Corps to boast and accelerate growth in green infrastructure initiatives at this moment in time, I'll add. You know, I, you know, I think we continue to work with the federal agencies in, in all of our projects and, you know, we, you know, I think we have to continue to work on everything that, you know, pretty much the same way. I mean, there's things that have a little, happen at a macro level, and we all have our opinions of that, but there's things that happen at the day-to-day -day level, and I think that largely continues, and um, whether you're dealing with, you know, permits on wetlands, whether you're dealing with, you know, highway issues or transit issues, and I mean, we're, you know, there, you know, life goes on. We continue to work with the federal agencies, housing issues, that's just continuing as challenging as it may be in this you know, current administration. And I would also say that uh, I dealt with the Corps of Engineers in 1988 and 89 with respect to the Riverwalk, and going under the bridges, they said was an absolute non-starter. Well, it took 26 years, but <laughs> uh, Rahm Emanuel figured it out, and he also got money from the federal government for this, for this Riverwalk. So dealing with the federal government is difficult, but you just have to get somebody who's very smart to learn how to do it. I wasn't smart enough. <laughs> and to your point, you know, the, the Riverwalk is funded with a TIFI alone, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's the type of thing that this kind of administration should be promoting and, and using more as a tool for private investment and public investment exactly. based on wise economics. Yeah. This question gets to affordable housing and how any of you envision it being incorporated into riverfront development to ensure the diversity of the communities along the river. Yeah, speaking of that, so affordable housing in America is an issue, and I would say that this city is paying a lot of attention to that, and I know that the commissioner of, uh, of building uh, is focusing on, on the codes, and the codes have to be changed and modernized. There are so many innovative ways <clears throat> to, buy, to build housing much more cheaply than we can by following the existing codes which were written in the 50s and 60s. And that is going to happen in this city. I feel very confident that it will. And there's a lot of attention in this area. And it's, it's gonna happen in Chicago. It will. Okay. Another question on the kind of ecological front. How does water level variability and connectivity to combined sewer create opportunities or challenge for riverside use? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I, I, I would guess that that was written before I got on my little soapbox earlier, but um, it, it's, it's a major challenge, obviously. Um, I think the, D David St. Pierre and the entire team at the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District is doing a tremendous job. They've uh, began several initiatives, heat capture from waste collection, different aeration mechanisms. I mean, it, it is tremendous. But the reality is, with a combined sanitary and storm system, relatively clean water coming from the skies becomes polluted. And so one of the really heartening things about the Chicago Code um, that's been implemented in the last, I don't know, 10, 20 years has been really aggressive and robust stormwater management on site. Uh, being able to implement a storm trap type system with permeable pavers and other mechanisms to allow as much of that uh, clean water to percolate into the soil um, has been, I think, a game changer. But there's so much more work to be done. And I think between what the Commissioner of Buildings is doing as, as John alluded to with modular construction and other things that are being explored, as well as the stormwater capture and the fast permit uh, process in Chicago, uh, I, I, I see great things happening in the future. And I, we also have the deep tunnel project, which the federal taxpayers are paying a lot for, which even though Senator Percy voted against it, and we've spent billions of dollars on that project, and it is continuing 
there were articles recently about that in the paper, and that's a, probably in today's dollars, if it were to start now, it's probably a $10, $12 billion project. So we're, we're not ignoring this issue. They're just such long-standing issues. It takes a really long time to, to address um, any of these horizontal infrastructure issues that are going to continue to cost more and more and more. And, you know, as belts tighten, as economies get harder, it's, it's harder to fund those things when schools need money, other interest group, you know, other uh, interests that are social infrastructure need money. But it's something that we need to address and we need to pay particular attention to as a city. One of the things we're seeing, uh, which is a change in sort of aesthetic value, is the idea of not just uh, holding water on site, but also uh, the sponge city concepts, permeable urban ground plains, shifting away from the mowed lawn to uh, native grasses. Uh, and uh, I think also the shift from most city park departments to allow uh, bio filtration of urban stormwater in public parks. Uh, so I think that all of these things add up to getting more water in the aquifer and less water in pipes, polluted water in pipes that go straight out to waterways. And I think that shift in aesthetic value, I think, needs to keep moving forward. Uh, mowed lawns aren't really the smartest way to go. And if we could shift our aesthetic values to native grasses, that would make a huge, that alone would make a huge impact. There's been, uh, you know, Chicago's looked a lot at European examples, particularly German examples of green and vegetative roofs to combat the urban heat island effect. Um, but we can look back to them now as a lot of European countries are implementing green roof solutions that have the ability to capture more water in the planting medium itself. So the storm capture becomes a, a, a component of the green roof as well as a subterranean storm trap system and other things like that. But I think it's incumbent upon all developers, all architects to continue to research and look to examples both here and abroad for how we can be better about stormwater. And this might be close to the last question, but I think having gone to the exhibition and seen a lot of the renderings that really get at the sort of leisure and recreational uses, and yet um, there are still commercial uses and barges, and just this question that I'm curious as well, how do you all foresee how those uses are balanced? commercial and, and recreation. Well, that's the whole purpose of the Ideas Lab. You need to come across the street, look at the ideas, <laughs> sign on to our website, give us your ideas, we'll incorporate that. I don't think we know the answer to that quite yet. That's, the, that's our whole lab. So um, I hope you'll all come across the street and give us your ideas on those, that very question. All right. So thank you. To close the panel, I want to thank all of you um, for this discussion and thanks to the audience for participating tonight. Um, particularly a great thanks to the, uh, Chicago's Department of Planning and Development and for the Metropolitan Planning Council for coordinating this evening's programs and to all of the staff for helping me not <laughs> trip over my, myself tonight. Um, and as I think David already made the pitch to visit um, across the street, we also welcome you to see all the exhibits in the Cultural Center um, and throughout this, the city. You can't miss the shimmery awning of the River Ideas, River Edge Ideas Lab. Um, and there's, there's also many more talks planned um, at www.chiriverlab.com. So thank you once again and enjoy the rest of your evening.